Uh, of course, when you look at Trump's appeal to the Supreme Court here, as we read through this, one thing that stood out was how his attorneys cite the landmark case known as the United States versus Nixon four different times. At one point, his attorneys say that the Watergate case is a reason that they believe this trial should also be delayed. There's almost no one better to talk about the lessons from that case than my next guest here tonight, Richard Nixon's former White House counsel, John Dean. It's great to have you here, John. I wonder, when you look at this, do you think Trump's attorneys are, are missing the point of that case? Or what did you make of how many times it surfaced in this filing? Well, I've noticed they've drawn on the Nixon precedents uh, across the board. They, uh, we've had very few presidents who've been in front of uh, the Supreme Court. And the case they're drawing on, he actually was already out of office. Uh, the Fitzgerald case, which did give a president civil immunity. So I, and, and that sort of drew the line at official conduct, or the outer perimeter of official conduct. So we've really never had the same issue. And the form that's coming to the court right now, Caitlin, is not the full case. They're asking for an application for a stay. They're asking that the Court of Appeals not send the case back to the D.C. trial judge. They want to hold that up until at least they file a, a, an appeal for the full court to come back up and take on the case again. It's a little confusing, I know, uh, but it's a unique opportunity if the Supreme Court wants to get rid of this case that, that request for stay, that application, went to the circuit justice who is Roberts in this, uh, Chief Justice Roberts. Mm -hmm. he, could, he could make a decision right now to chuck the whole thing. Yeah, it'll be fascinating because that would be probably the most dramatic outcome here, which, you know, we've... Very dramatic people outcome. Are, people are torn on, on whether or not that'll be the case. But if it does go to the Supreme Court, if they don't chuck the whole thing... You know, you testified at Justice Kavanaugh's confirmation hearing, and you talked about how you believed that if, if he was confirmed, that it would have, we would have the most presidential powers-friendly Supreme Court in the modern age. And so if it does go, you know, how do you think someone like a Justice Kavanaugh will look at the arguments that we were just talking about there with Jim Trustee? I think he generally looks favorably on presidential powers. He worked at the White House. Uh, he was in the council's office, in fact, uh, knows how the machine works and how to make it work better. Uh, he knows the restrictions that are on it. And his court has generally been very presidential uh, power pro uh, and favorable. So I think that, uh, but this is a different issue. This is really the responsibility of whether a president has any boundaries at all. Uh, so I, you know, I would be, I would be shocked if they, when they get to the substance of this case, if they grant immunity. It really would be, a, really a dramatic change in the nature of the American presidency. It's yeah. actually a foundation for a dictatorship. Well, and reading, you know, presidential powers is one thing, and thinking a president has power when it comes to climate change, executive orders, or, or something of that nature. But if he's someone, you know, who worked in the White House Counsel's Office, who, who understands what the powers of the presidency are, I mean, could you see a Supreme Court justice looking at Trump's actions in Georgia and in Pennsylvania and, and what he did surrounding 2020 and thinking that that fits into the job description? No, I cannot. In fact, I think that he would find an abhorrent uh, behavior, uh, unacceptable for a president. And so that, but, you know, I don't think that's the issue that's in front of him at the time, but he's certainly well aware of the underlying behavior. He's also aware, Caitlin, of the fact that Donald Trump is using the process to try to get out of this whole thing. If he thinks he can get reelected by fooling enough people as to what he does and doesn't do and get back in office, that he can kill these cases. He can tell the, his attorney general of choice kill the case, drop them, so the federal cases would go away. And they could put up a pretty good argument to tie up the state cases, at least while he remained in office. What would that mean for the presidency if he did that? If he did get in and we, I mean, it's not that far-fetched, if he did have the attorney general just make his cases disappear? Well, he has said he wants to be a dictator for one day. That's all it takes to change the American presidency. He'll have a stack of executive orders lined up that will, in fact, make the presidency 
a dictatorship, even if he doesn't call it that. If he just says, I have a, uh, a modernized the American presidency, giving him powers the likes of which we've never known in, in the American presidency. The checks and balances would go away. He'd be unleashed, and I think we'd be in trouble as a country. John Dean, a stark warning. Thank you for joining tonight. Also here to break down that filing, a pair of former federal prosecutors, Christy Greenberg and Ellie Honig. Ellie, who is actually quoted in this brief, I should know. I Were you a little surprised to see that? I'm learning that right now. I, I, I fear <laughs> what they quoted me on. You haven't seen this? No. You're quoted in this. <laughs> no, no one I read the brief you? quickly. Tell me what I'm quoted on. They cite, well, it's in a footnote, but they cite That's something you wrote, which is that, that Jack Smith never uses the E oh, word, I, which is... Election. Yes. I, look, I'm, I'm dubious of Jack Smith's motives. It's clear to everyone. See, we're always breaking news here on The Source. Yeah, we're right telling. to the person's face. <laughs> uh, my criticism of Jack Smith is obviously he's pushing to get this in before the election. I think for good reason, but there's a level of disingenuousness in his refusal to say that's why. And I argue in the piece that I think they mentioned here that he should just say it. Say what we all know and say what the vast majority of the American people understand and believe is correct, that he's pushing to get this done before trial. Before the election, excuse me. Can we talk about, you know, what the Supreme Court is looking at here? Because there are a few different pathways they can take. One of them, John Dean already laid out for us, so we'll cross it off the list, which is that they could just say, no thanks, we're not taking this up. They could deny Trump's request to pause this. What else do could they do here? So this application today was just for, as John Dean said, for a stay, to put this on put this on hold in the Supreme Court so that it can go back to Judge Chutkin and she can set a trial date. The brief actually says that what they want to do is go to the whole D.C. circuit en banc, meaning all of the judges will hear this, and then potentially, depending on how that goes, go to the Supreme okay, but pause. Court. Isn't that unlikely, though, because it would have to get... They'd have to have enough judges to where one of the three judges who ruled this to the, to, to weigh in, to basically reject their own ruling, which is not going to happen, right? I, I don't think, not only would the three not reject it, but I think the fact that you had the timing here be so quick means that this has this opinion was socialized with the other justices, would, my, would be my guess, in the D.C. Court of Appeals. Okay, so we're waiting to see what they decide. I mean, now Chief Justice John Roberts, given his role here, What's his next instruction to, to Jack Smith? What's the next timeline here? So I, I think it's really important people understand there's a, a lot of procedural terminology flying here, a lot of legal nerd words, mandate, uh, certiorari, all that. This is it. This is the moment of truth. This is where, at the end of this, the Supreme Court's going to tell us, are they putting a pause on the district court, the trial court, and are they taking the case? The first thing I think we're going to see is the chief justice is going to say, OK, Donald Trump, we have your request here to pause this. We'll give Jack Smith's team a couple days to respond, and then the Supreme Court is going to decide first, will we keep this on pause? And most importantly, will we take this case? And to that end, I was looking at the brief here, not the footnote mentioning me, <laughs> but I was looking at the brief here. Donald Trump's team is desperately trying to convince the Supreme Court, you have to take this case, you the Supreme Court. And they have the following quote, Donald Trump's team has the following quote in their brief, quote, it is of imperative public importance that President Trump's claims of immunity be resolved by this court, the Supreme Court, and, quote, only this court, the Supreme Court, can definitively resolve them. You know who they're quoting there? Jack, Jack Smith. Smith. That's a tough one. And you know what's interesting, though, about this, when you talk about this moment of truth that we're in, if the Supreme, Trump could lose here on the merits, but still win theoretically yeah. because it's delayed so far that then the trial doesn't happen before the election. Right. And I think the Supreme Court knows that. And just like we saw in the oral argument in Colo with the Colorado ballot, where the ju justices were very clear about, we care about the consequences. We think it's just a step too far to disqualify him from the ballot. That seemed to be the consensus. And similarly here, they get the consequences. They know that if they just sat on this, that it would effectively mean he does have immunity, even if not on the merits, just because it doesn't happen before the election. I don't think they will do that. I think within a week or two, they're going to make a decision about whether or not this goes back to the judge in the trial court. And I think that because this question, yes, it is a question of first impression. It hasn't been decided by the Supreme Court before. But this is yeah. such a strong opinion by the DC Court of Appeals. I don't see them overturning it. And for that reason, I do think this goes back to Judge Chutkin. But also, this is such a big week. I think every, you know, we talk about Trump's legal developments. This week stands alone when I'm looking at the schedule, because also on Thursday in Georgia, the judge there is, there's going to be a hearing. And he said today, 
that there is a world where the district attorney, Fonnie Willis, could be disqualified if she benefited financially from the relationship that she's now acknowledged she has with a prosecutor on her team. I mean, that could have monumental impact on this case. Yeah, everything is happening this week. I mean, literally every case involving Donald Trump criminal case has something important going on. This dispute is playing out in Jack Smith's immunity case. We also had a hearing today on the Mar-a-Lago case that suggests that might be delayed. Thursday, we have a hearing on the Manhattan DA's hush money case that will tell us likely whether that's actually going to trial in March. And then, Caitlin, what you just raised, very worrisome signs for the DA, Fonnie Willis, there. The judge said, we are having a hearing. Fonnie Willis said, judge, we should not even be having a hearing. You should throw this out. Judge said, nope, we need to have a hearing. Could be really troublesome for the DA. Big legal week. We'll be consulting our experts here. Christy Greenberg, Ellie Honig, thank you both.